many electrons typically fill the valence shell? Raise your hand. How many electrons typically fill the valence shell? Cody. How many electrons typically fill the valence shell? No. Oh, oh, think uh, eight. Eight. Yeah. Think noble gas. Eight electrons. Good job, Cody. So, in the chapter on molecular compounds, we're getting ready to read. You're going to see some exceptions here. Ionic compounds typically no exceptions there. The metal transfers to the non-metal, and you get eight. The exceptions come in when you're looking at the covalent compounds. So you're going to see some that have more than eight. And you see some that have less than eight. Give me an example of one that has less than eight. Helium. Helium. Very good. So helium typically will be, uh, yeah, be the exception. Hydrogen can be the exception as well. Uh, Hydrogen is bonded to itself. Page? Behaves like helium. Um, page. 40. Now, um, second question, how many Vesper geometries are possible? Okay, so I gave you this handout when you came in. It says Vesper geometries. I was just trying to see how quick you can data interpret or count the number of shapes in a graph. Raise your hand when you got it. Raise your hand. Nope. No. Uh, Michaela? Six. No. Fifteen. Four. Right. Very good. Yeah, and I know some of those chemistry. Hey, you would go to integrated science. No. Integrated science A is complex. Yeah. All right. So if you took biology last huh? year, these Vesper geometries are very important because most of the compounds in your body are what type? Starts with C. Covalent. Yeah, most of the compounds in your body are covalent. So they're going to be following these Vesper geometries. That is, when they bond together, the angles are important when we start trying to figure out ways to um, make something, whether it's a protein or an enzyme. Your body might, need to, might be deficient in making these things, so we're trying to change your DNA so now it works correctly. Or if you're trying to, you know, um, kill a cancer or something like that, you're going to you're going to want to be able to target specific, right? So, uh, these geometries are very important. There are 15 of them. We're going to look at that today. At the bottom, they give you a three-dimensional, I guess you would say, drawing of what they look like. You get the linear, and they give you some examples. Um, example with a tetrahedral would be methane, CH4, and we're going to look at that here in just a second. At the top, you'll see the steric number. That's the number of atoms bonded to the central atom of the molecule. So right here, that's what you're seeing here. The steric number is two, you see E, does everybody see E there? And there's X on each side, everybody see that? But when it says two, it means there are two X's there. Does anybody, everybody see the two X's? Anybody not see the two X's? Two means there's two X's, one, two. Three means there's three X's, one, two, three. Does everybody see the three X's there, Layton? See the three X's? Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, four, you see four X's. Anybody not see the four X's there? One, two, three, four. When we see the lone pairs, everybody see where it says one lone pair? Guess how many lone pair are going to be around it? One. So you can see, when you see steric three, you have one lone pair around it. Does everybody see that? You might not see that. Well, we see three. See three, and then you see the one lone pair? Yeah. Okay. Now, there's a formula for this mathematical. It's called AXN. So the A corresponds to the central atom. The X corresponds to how many X's you have. And N corresponds to how many lone pairs you have. So you can see this in the future. Like, you can see AX2N2. And that's going to correspond to bent or angular. So this is the algebraic way they would show this let's say without giving you the drawing for bent or angular. That would be a 109. Is everybody clear? Now I'm not going to make you memorize these, but this sheet is something you're probably going to want to hold on to because it shows you all of the 15 possible different angles. Very important to you know. 
have these in one place. You can see them in the textbook, but they don't give you all 15 of them. They don't give me or organized as well as this. It's really nice. has two X's on the outside and two lone pairs. So which shape would water be? Uh, a triangle? A linear? Yeah, it's actually linear. They're not showing you the two lone pairs around it. Um, let's see here. Got it. Actually, it's not linear. It's kind of it's kind of bent a little bit because water's polar, so they're missing the two electrons there. It kind of behaves like um, this one right here, where you see E and the two X's bent or angular. So when you change the lone pairs, you can see A X two. I want to draw your attention to that. The lone pairs can affect how many X's you have. So AX2 and 2, this is going to be the um, what water looks like is what we're trying to point out to you. Water does look like bent or angular. Sorry, it's kind of early this morning. I, I do remember that water's bent because it's polar, that it has a positive region and a negative region. The negative region is, is what? Is it the oxygen or the hydrogen? Yeah, it's oxygen. Negative is oxygen because it wants those electrons. Remember, nonmetals seek to gain electrons. When they do that, they become negative because they gain electrons. All right, let's take a look at the next one here, ammonia. Which um, structure would you think that would look like? You have uh, three X's and one lone pair. So we just go on here and we try to find the three X's and one lone pair. Tetrahedral. Okay, three X's. Yeah, tetrahedral or pyramidal. That's why this is really important because it kind of sees, lets you see what it looks like by itself. And then let's take a look at methane. Which one does methane look like? Methane there. Which one's methane? <laughs> Anybody? Tetrahedral. I wrote on the bottom of the page there methane CH4. You might want to do that as well. Methane is pretty significant because a lot of people have been getting their LG &E bill last month and it was like double what it normally is. So if you have a natural gas furnace, you most likely consumed a little more methane last month because of the cold temperatures. This is what methane looks like. It has this tetrahedral 10. 9.5 bonding angle. Everybody see that? 109.5 bonding angle. So each of these angles is 109.5. Bond, raise your hand. Heather, it's a sigma bond. A single covalent. You are paying attention. Hannah just read that. A single covalent bond. A single covalent bond. Very good. All right, so let's read on what a pi bond is. Can we read there for us? A pi bond. All right. A pi bond. It says a pi, the pi bond. I'll read. I right, go ahead. A multiple pi bond. How does that work? Okay, what comes first, the sigma or the pi? The sigma. The sigma is first. Okay. So we're talking about what happens when you have double and triple bonds. So sigma comes first, and after you have a sigma, then you can have one pi, which would be a double bond, and then you'd have a sigma and then 2 pi, which would be a triple bond. So that's typically how it works. If you read again where it says the pi bonds occur, it says um, pi bonds form, write that down, you might want to write this down in your notes, pi bonds form, pi bonds pi forms when parallel orbitals overlap and share electrons. So we'll, see, we'll show you a diagram that just here in a second. I've never observed a bond greater than the triple bond. That doesn't mean it can't occur. We just haven't like documented it. So we've documented the double, the single, and the triple. So the sigma here in the center on page 246, 
turn to page 246, you'll see we've got a ethene C2H4. These, this is the carbon in green. So there are two carbon atoms. Everybody see the two green carbon atoms? You might not see the two green carbon atoms. Claire, did you see the two green carbon yes. atoms? All right, so um, between the two, you'll see the pi bond. The P is the overlap. So you have one overlap on the top and you have one overlap on the bottom. And those are both the pi bonds. Does everybody see that? You might not see that. So what's stronger, a single bond or a triple bond? A triple bond. A triple bond is much harder to break. That means that you're not gonna free up those atoms easily. Like we talked about last week with uh, magnesium oxide compared to uh, magnesium chloride. The oxide is bonded stronger to the magnesium because it has a greater charge. The bond association energy is critical valence bond. Reaction is how about Gavin? It's an exothermic reaction. Right, energy is released from the reaction. How about uh, let's go with uh, Clayton? What's an endothermic reaction? Right, so if you look on page 247, uh, fluorine is still going to require energy to go. The issue here is whether when the reaction starts, does it produce energy? Like when you burn carbon, like wood, it gives off more energy than it needed to react. That's why it keeps going. They call that spontaneous. Once you start it, it keeps going. So things that are non-spontaneous, you got to keep adding more energy to keep them going they won't go unless you add more Does that make sense yeah. 248, 248 introduces naming this is what we looked at on the last test and quiz the prefixes here so we're seeing that again we're just looking at some structures now now the complexity of naming the covalent compounds is greater on the back of your Vesper sheet here you'll see some organic common names. Does everybody see those? Yes. Organic common names. Now, you, if you pursue college in this, you'll probably have to memorize those, uh, these names here like the acetone, the acetic acid, um, formaldehyde, formic acid, ethylene, toluene, uh, benzene, Phenol, the formic acid. Does everybody see those? Now, if you look at those common organic names, you'll notice that you don't see an R there. Did anybody see an R in those common names there? Like formaldehyde does not have an R in it. Now, if you look above, you see the functional group list? You'll see an R there. What does the R correspond to, Jake? On this list here, these... Uh, organic functional groups. What does the R correspond to? What element is R? Cody, what element is R? Uh, I don't know. Radon? No. Radium. <laughs> what element is R, Michaela? What? No, it's not an element. I was just messing with you. Oh, come on! You could have made it up, like radium. It's not an element. Basically, it, it corresponds to a chain of carbon atoms. So R is a chain. So if you look over on the other side here, you'll see some of these chains. So these chains can connect to this H. So like for alcohol. 
Does everybody see the R next to the alcohol for the functional group? Yep. There's yep. different types of alcohol. There's like methanol, ethanol. ethanol. That's the easiest one really to see the difference. Methanol would be one carbon. Methanol. ethanol would be two carbons. Two carbons. <laughs> for water, on the sheet for water, you will see that water behaves like we mentioned, uh, bent or angular, right? So up here you can see the bent molecular geometry, right? That's the molecular geometry. Well, there's an electron geometry as well, and that's going to be associated with the tetrahedral, because it's got these pairs here. So which one do we tend to um, define water more often? Do we, do we define it as the tetrahedral or bent? bent? Typically we look at it as bent because the Vesper is going to define it that way. It's, it's defining it with the electrons there as bent. Does everybody see that on the Vesper geometries? And the Vesper is the one more often used. No. How many valence electrons typically fill the valence shell? Is it higher than 10? Less. There are eight. Very good, Nate. To form new compounds. Uh, the noble gases. You read in chapter 6 that all noble gases have stable electron arrangements. This stable arrangement consists of full out. What is a covalent bond, Zane? Right, so when electrons get shared, you end up forming covalent bonds. Those are typically with the nonmetals. Now, I've spoken with you earlier that um, in some analogies to help remember this, metals are kind of like men, and that metals seek to lose their electrons, they seek to be providers, right? And that um, nonmetals tend to be like women, and that they seek to gain knowledge and they seek to uh, cause reactions to occur. Uh, typically the man kneels and asks the woman to marry her in this country. So um, women tend to want to share things and guys tend to want to trade them. Now trades are a lot more risky. You go to the stock market, make an investment and be like, hey, can I share a trade with you? Or can I share a stock with you? They're like, well, I'm not going to share any stocks with you, but we can do a trade. You give me money, I give you this stock. And it's risky because the stock can do what? Yeah, I can lose value. It's not good. Right, so uh, if we were to share stocks, right, that would mean like um, if uh, Jamal and I held the same stock when he sold it, he would share his profit with me. But that's not how it works, right? If Jamal buys low, let's say he buys a stock at a dollar and he sells it at a hundred dollars, are you going to share your profit with me, Jamal? Yeah, yeah, Jamal, he's not going to share his profits with him. That's not typically how it works. Have you ever seen The Wolf of Wall Street? It's a movie. I don't recommend it because it's very naughty. Bad movie. Naughty movie. Anyway, um, sharing. So, nonmetals tend to share electrons. Now, when I first married my wife, shh. We would go out together and she'd buy some clothes. And at that time, we were 
We had a couple children and our budget was rather tight. Now, I'm not a financial advisor. This is a guy called Dave Ramsey, and he's a financial advisor. If you want to go for you know, financial advice, you go to him. He tells you, uh, get out of debt, you know, beans and rice. You need beans and rice to get out of debt. College debt, bad. All debt, bad. Bad, right? So my wife, we go out and we buy some clothes, and then my wife starts sharing clothes with her sister. And I'm kind of thinking, beans and rice, this isn't working. You're sharing clothes. We don't want that happening because she might get something on those clothes or ruin them. Then you're not going to have any clothes. That's not good. Now, I would have gotten upset and stopped that had I not learned this in chemistry that, you know, women are a little bit... I can't change a woman is what I'm telling you. If I said no to her sharing, she's going to start thinking, well, you're trying, you're kind of trying to ch change me into what you want me to be. No, you will not change a woman. Just like she can't change you. You're wired to trade. What does that mean? Well, I mow the lawn, she does the dishes. If you go old school, you can see even... Well, that happens, but if you go back like my parents, my parents are old school and my dad, he's totally this way. He does one thing, my mom does the other. Total trade happening in my growing up lifestyle. Also, like my uncle, he lives on a farm. He does all the work outside of the house. He doesn't do anything inside of the house. That's not saying anything bad about him. I'm just telling you that's how he feels most comfortable. He feels trade. I do this, you do that. Now, my wife, she tried to get me to share in everything, like she was doing the laundry. I do do some sharing around the house because I understand that's how she wired. So she's trying to get me to share in everything. So she stacks the laundry next to the closet and she's like, does that bother you? Yes, it bothered me that it wasn't put up. But, you know, I was like, I am who I am. I'm going to still trade some things. I'm going to do a few things and she's going to do a few things. That's how trades work. So I did not say no to her sharing clothes with her sister. And I'm glad that I didn't do that because uh, she ended up passing away a couple years ago. And that would have caused some grief between me and her after she passed away. She was like, you wouldn't even let me share clothes with her. But see, I did let her share clothes. So we were all good when she did happen to pass away. So keep that in mind. Anything can happen in life. And you just always want to kind of know a little bit about yourself, cover your bases chemistry-wise. Because it is chemistry.com. It's a dating website. You know, when relationships didn't work out right, chemistry wasn't right. You're made of chinops carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. You can't deny what you're made of is the point that I'm trying to make to you. With steric number three, you've got three X's or two X's in a lone pair. The X's correspond to another central atom. The dots co correspond to the lone pair. So with that said, what does water most likely, what geometry does water possess? The molecular shape of water has two possibilities. You've got this electronic geometry, includes all atoms and lone pairs on central atoms. So that would be the electron geometry is going to be the tetrahedral. So the tetrahedral is going to be seen in steric number four. Now you'll notice that the steric number is the same for, for both tetrahedral and the bent. Does everybody see that? Look at four, you see tetrahedral and bent are in the same, I guess you would say, row. All right, so the molecular shape ignores lone pairs. And you must know the electronic geometry to obtain the correct molecular shape. That is to understand what it looks like three-dimensional. This balance of forces is upset. A covalent bond can be broken. Because covalent bonds differ in strength, some bonds break more easily. Alright, so in your book on page 246, figure 8.9, this pi overlap represents one, sig one sigma bond and then one pi bond. This is a double bond for ethene, right? It's a double bond. So it says here that the carbon atoms are close enough 
that the side-by-side -side p orbitals overlap and form the pi bond. This results in a donut-shaped cloud around the sigma bond. See kind of the donut-shaped cloud there on page 246. Now up here on the board is what a triple bond looks like right here. Uh, the triple bond has two donut-shaped clouds. You can see how you have one here and one there. It's kind of separated just a tad. So you have two donut-shaped clouds here. This would be uh, the double bond there. There's two there. Uh, and you see just the one donut-shaped cloud. It's a little clearer on the laptop. You can see the double bond there. How many electrons typically fill the valence shell? Raise your hand. No, that would be helium. Raise your hand. No. Noble gas. Eight. So eight would be the noble gas configuration. If you remember, at the beginning of this month, we talked about ionic bonds and how they transfer electrons. Sodium has one electron and transfers to chlorine, which has seven. And what's seven plus one? Eight. Now, the ionic compounds tend to always follow the valence shell rule. That is, you'll typically see eight around it. Um, around, that is, that's what you're, you don't see exceptions to the eight rule. Well, when we start looking at covalent compounds, you tend to see some exceptions. And this Vesper geometry kind of shows you that. If you look at, let's say, the sawhorse or the seesaw, Everybody see the sawhorse or the seesaw? You've got uh, one, two, three, four, five things around it. So that means you have, what's five times two? You have ten electrons around that central atom. So molecular geometry or molecular compounds, covalent compounds that is, tend to have a little more exceptions associated with the valence shell. I don't know of any associated with ionic compounds, but there probably is one out there that I just don't know about. Uh, so when you find out, you can email me and I'll say thank you. And why do we care about Vesper geometries? Well, if you remember biology and you studied DNA, raise your hand if you remember DNA. All right. DNA, you've got base pairs associated with DNA. You've got A, adenine, thymine, guanine cytosine, right? Four different base pairs in DNA. Well, the, the base pairs have geometries associated with them. Each central atom has a geometry associated with it. So when you start sticking more than one atom together, you can then get a spatial picture of what it looks like. That is important when we start looking at medicine. We start looking at making new substances. Chapter 7, you read that metals and nonmetals gain stability by transferring, gaining or losing electrons to. The Vesper geometry for ammonia. It's a triagonal pyramid. Very good, Mikhail. Everybody see that? All right, let's do one more. Methane. What is the Vesper geometry for methane? Carlos, tetrahedral. Now, on your paper, I placed methane at the bottom. You got a, a visual of the tetrahedral shape. And it is in the graph tetrahedral for the shape for methane, 104. Correction, 109 degrees, which will be the bond angle. The Greek letter pi forms when parallel orbitals overlap and share electrons. The shared electron pair of pi bond occupies the space above and below the line that represents. Notice that this double bond has the sigma bond at the center. Does everybody see that? And then the parallel, or correction, the, the P1 overlaps outside the, outside the center. It says um, the P orbitals overlap and form the pi bond. The results in the donut shape 
cloud around the sigma bomb. So the sigma is in the central, in the center, right? And it's centered between the two atoms. Now up on the overhead here, this is an example of a triple bomb. On the handout that I gave you, if you look on the back side, now we'll be using this all through the week. We just got it today to save paper. Uh, if you look at the alkene, A-L-K-Y-N-E, the alkene, that is a triple bond. Organic compounds, a name for it, the alkene. So up here, this is an alkene. And you'll notice that there are two donut overlaps. Everybody see that here? There's two of them here. This is the first one. There's just one overlap. One donut overlap. Here you have two. This is a double bond. This is a triple bond. So you can see what it looks like. Now if they had it in the book here, you would see two of these donuts around the sigma. Just one donut is a double bond. Two donuts is a triple bond. So we want to show you that because I don't want you to see this picture in the book and think this is a triple bond here. We have the sigma and these two pi's. That's not a triple. The donut represents one pi bond, as you can see up here. The book does a really good job of illustrating this. They use it in automobiles. So the R corresponds to any carbon chain. So you might want to write that down. R equals any carbon chain. So you have a one carbon chain and a two carbon chain. With uh, Nat, Alyssa, Shh. what? No, eight. Naomi, eight is correct. I would have guessed that. All right, so last week, last week, we talked about ionic compounds. Josh, I'm not going to talk over you. Last week, we talked about ionic compounds and how they do what with their electrons? Starts with a T. Transfer. Now, the ionic compounds typically stick to the eight valence electron rule. That is, you'll typically only see eight around them. Now, the molecular compounds 
are specifically the covalent compounds, they can go outside of eight. So when you came in, I gave you this sheet, and the second Bellwork question is, how many Vesper geometries are possible? I guess you would say, Bill Gates rob a bank. Because he already has a lot of money. Right, he doesn't need to go rob a bank. He's not gonna do that. Um, so stability is associated with gaining things. Specifically for the elements, that would be electrons. The nonmetals like to gain things. Now if you're a metal then, you like to lose them because when you lose them, your lower energy level is full and that's gonna be the one that's displayed. So the goal is eight and there are different ways to get to eight. You know, there's always things called shortcuts. For the metals, they're gonna take a shortcut. It's easier to lose one than to gain seven. So for the non-metal, it's gonna say, I desire to gain that electron. 8.9 represent a double bond or a triple bond. Figure 8.9, raise your hand. Uh, Alyssa? Double? Triple? Triple? Double? Single. Triple? Single. Now, it, let's look. Let's look at the figure. Right next to it, you see the two lines there? The C and the two lines? That says it's a double bond. Two lines. Two lines. Look, you could easily think, like this morning I actually thought it was a triple bond. I didn't read it. I just looked at it. And I looked at these three lines here and I thought, well, that's one, two, three, it's a triple bond. But it's not showing you a triple bond, it's showing you a double bond. The two lines are right here. Double bond. If you read the figure here, it says that the pi orbitals overlap and form the pi bond. This results in a donut-shaped cloud. So on the overhead up here, I've given you the example of a triple bond. You can see here that there are two donut-shaped clouds. This is a triple bond. There's three lines here. This is the double bond. So if they had a triple bond in the book, you would actually see two donuts around it. That would be difficult to draw. No, it's not rubidium. No. What element is R? Uh, Cameron? Josh? Right on, no. James? What element is R? Raise your hand. There is no R. There is no R. There is no R. Says how many electrons typically fill the valence shell? Raise your hand, Sean. Yes, there are eight. Eight typically is the number. Now, uh, second bell war question, Kunik. How many Vesper geometries are possible? Three. No. Four. You know where you'd find those? No, on the sheet that I gave you, and the sheet that I gave you came in, these are the Vesper geometries. Now where you see a blank there, see the blanks? Those are not possible. I know some people think that anything is possible, but guess what? I'm not gonna have a baby. There are 15. 15 possibilities. Which Vesper shape is ammonia, Noah? Kunik? No. How many atoms are around ammonia? There's three hydrogen atoms. How many lone pair are around ammonia? There's one. So if you look on this diagram, you're looking for three X's and one lone pair. Where do you see three X's and one lone pair? Okay, so look right here. You see here, there's three X's on the uh, trigonal planner. See there's three X's on trigonal planner, but you need a lone pair with that. So it's not trigonal planner. So it's... Trigonal 
This trigonal pyramid. You can see it right there, trigonal pyramid. Good job. Points for that. Pi. The Greek letter pi forms when parallel orbitals overlap and share electrons. The shared electron pair of a pi bond occupies the space above and below the line that represents. Noah. Double. 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 Triple. Triple. Single. Single. Now, uh, if you look in the figure, right, this one right here, it looks like it could be a triple because you've got a, a bond right here. No, you see the bond right here? And you see the sigma there and you see a bond right here. So it does look like a triple, right? Yeah. It's actually a double. That's points for me. You look in the book there, it's a double. I said double too, so no. Yeah, I said it first. You look at the organic functional list, alcohol, it says R-O-H. So the question is, what element does R stand for? 15 points. No. 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 What? Lithium? No. 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 Noah? No. What element does R stand for? No, Ethan. What element does R stand for? Radon? No. It's none of them. Very good. We found in some cough drops. Propyl is not following the functional group that I gave you in the handout where it said ROH. So just be aware that it can be written more than one way. I typically follow this way so I know that I'm working with an alcohol. This way you could confuse somebody. If I saw this, I wouldn't know it's an alcohol. If I saw this, I'd know it's an alcohol. So it's just a way for me to know. A lot of times labels can get torn off, so it's best to you know, follow the functional group. Stephen, that is correct. There are eight valence electrons. Very good. How many Vesper shapes are there? Four. Now, the sheet that I gave you when you came in shows you the Vesper shapes. Everybody see the Vesper shapes? Now, does everybody see the blanks there, the blank boxes? Those are not possible. Some things are not possible. Like, it's not possible to walk on the moon. Correction, it's not possible to walk on the sun. You can walk on the moon, walk on the moon. Uh, it's not possible for, let's say, um, well, you can't walk on the sun. no, no. you like you melt. Yeah. It's not possible for me to have a baby, like a baby out of me, not gonna happen. Now you can pray all that you want to have a baby, but I'm not gonna have a baby. My dad has never had a baby. No, I we have no babies. <laughs>